Okay, this evening is The Power That Works In Us, Part 2. So we're talking about the power of God and how it works in our lives. This morning we talked about uh, walking in the Spirit and how God uh, works in our hearts and lives to uh, change us, to make us different, to give us victory over sin and uh, give us, um, really to make us like Christ. Uh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, we access that by faith. We trust the Lord to do what He has promised to do. Okay, tonight uh, in part two we're talking about the filling of the Spirit. And um, I said this morning that the two different things, walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit, um, they are different but they are not totally separate. Um, they depend on one another, at least uh, being filled with the Spirit depends on you walking in the Spirit to some extent. Um, okay, let's start off with Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and we'll start with verse 5. Acts 1, 5, let's read this and then we'll have a word of prayer. Acts 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We appreciate that you have left us a record of what happened uh, in the life of Christ and in the time of the apostles uh, and many other historical facts. But beyond that, you have left us instructions on how we are to live and uh, we would ask you please to help us to learn and understand and help us to apply the things that we learn uh, to our lives that we would uh, be witnesses for you. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the promise, Christ said, in a few days, not many days hence, um, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he says, John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Uh, then they asked him uh, a question that seems to be irrelevant at the moment, but he asked a question, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And uh, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Um, let me just mention this, it's not terribly important uh, to the message, but the word power at the end of verse 7 is a Greek word that means authority. Um, the times and the seasons are in the Father's authority. He decides uh, when Christ is going to come and that kind of thing, when the kingdom will be restored and so on. These are, are His decisions to make. The very next verse says, but ye shall receive power, and it's a different Greek word. Um, Personally, I don't understand why they translate two different words by the same English word when they're only a few words apart in the text. Uh, but anyway, uh, God has the authority to set the times and the seasons, but He is going to give to us power, uh, dunamis, power, after the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And that power is for the purpose of making us witnesses. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so the entire earth is supposed to hear the message of the gospel. We are to be witnesses of Christ. Obviously this is something that was not fulfilled in the apostles' day, and the Lord didn't expect it to be fulfilled in their day. That would be impossible. Uh, that's just beyond you know, 12 men to accomplish. Uh, in their lifetime. Uh, and it's something that honestly uh, has yet to be accomplished. There are probably billions of people in the world who do not know what Jesus Christ means. 
Uh, they, they are not familiar with the name, and if they've ever heard it, they probably have some false idea of it. The false gospel is a lot more common than the real gospel. So anyway, he promised in a few days the Holy Spirit is going to be sent upon you and you will get power to witness, power to preach the gospel, power to spread the gospel. Um, okay, so let's look at some other verses that deal with this subject of being baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit. We will come back to Acts, so you might want to uh, take your church bookmark and put it in, in your place here and uh, hold your place there in Acts. But well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. This, I think, is a very, very important uh, verse of Scripture. It teaches us a number of important things. He says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is going to uh, baptize us um, into the body of Christ. He is going to place us into the body of Christ, and it doesn't matter what you are, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, as long as you're a believer, then you will be baptized into the body of Christ and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So we have not only been baptized into the body of Christ, but we have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so He is inside us and outside us. Um, I think this is uh, what we see in Ephesians where we are sealed. I think it's we're sealed into the body of Christ. We'll look at those verses in just a moment. Um, let, let me share just a little bit of Greek with you again. Um, in Acts chapter 1, it says that, um, uh, let's see, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Uh, and in Corinthians, it says, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. And some people make a a big deal about that. Well, let's say you're, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and here you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. If you look in the uh, Textus Receptus Greek text, you'll find that the same preposition uh, is used in both verses. Um, so that's an artificial distinction uh, because of the translation. Um, and the word is in, uh, in both places. So uh, that's not really important. Um, okay, so we're baptized uh, in or with or by the Holy Spirit. Um, Greek prepositions can mean lots of different things. Uh, they really can. It's like when we say in, we mean in. When they say it, they can mean a lot of things. Um, okay, anyhow, uh, go with me to uh, Ephesians. We'll look in Ephesians chapter 2, first of all. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, he said in 1 Corinthians, we're baptized by one spirit into one body, which would be the body of Christ. In, the, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15, he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself, in Christ, of twain, of two, Jew and Gentile. If you read the context, that's what he's talking about, Jew and Gentile. So to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Okay, there is one body of Christ uh, in the world today, and we are baptized by one spirit into one body. Um, not multiple bodies of Christ. Uh, in the world, but one body of Christ. Um, so that's important for us to realize. And the Spirit of God has placed us into that body. And if you look over in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, uh, In whom ye also trusted, in Christ ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance or the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. A lot of these things happen at the moment of salvation and there are things that you don't feel. Okay, you don't feel the baptism of the Spirit. You don't feel the indwelling of the Spirit. You don't feel the earnest of your inheritance. Uh, any of that stuff. Okay, uh, there's not anything in Scripture that says you should feel anything. Uh, but these are things that happen to you at the moment of salvation. And they're very precious and very important. Uh, our salvation is secure because the Holy Spirit, there's several reasons why it's secure, but among them uh, the fact that, that the Holy Spirit is the seal and also He is the earnest. Uh, he's the guarantee. He's the down payment of uh, the earnest money that God has, has given to prove His uh, that He is in earnest about redeeming us uh, eventually. Um, okay, so um, baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's the promise, and that is what happened uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we will receive power to be witnesses uh, to the whole earth, and it, hap it happened that day. Uh, the fulfillment is in Acts chapter 2. So back to the book of Acts. Back to the book of Acts and chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Um, who does he mean when he says they were all of, of one accord uh, in one place? Uh, well, uh, let's see in verse 15, it says in those, uh, uh, chapter 1 verse 15, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. So on that day uh, there were 120 people there. But then in verse 26 he says, They gave forth their lots, and the lot fell, fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And then it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So it may have been 12 men, it may have been 120. Uh, we really don't know. It's not very important. Um, I have a hard time seeing because the, the way the story is told here, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all begin to speak with tongues. And if you got 120 people there speaking with tongues, and it wasn't gibberish, it was languages and it details the languages that were spoken. I think there's 16 languages listed here. Um, so it wasn't the supposed gift of tongues that's talked about today. But um, that seems like an awful lot of confusion. Uh, a dozen men uh, might have been hard. And I think what they did was they probably drew groups apart uh, from each other, separated a little bit, and they each spoke to a crowd of people. Um, anyway, uh, verse 2, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, so then they went on, and uh, we see in verse 21, if we, a quote from uh, the book of Joel in the Old Testament, it came to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so they're preaching the gospel to this crowd, and this is Peter, uh, after a while of them all speaking in tongues, uh, Peter apparently got everyone's attention and began speaking to the entire group, and uh, it says he lifted up his voice and said unto them, and then it gives details about his, his sermon, and uh, he talked about the uh, death and resurrection of Christ. Um, at the end of the chapter, uh, close to the end in verse uh, 41, 
Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, it doesn't say how many people were in the audience, but about 3,000 of them were saved on that day. Um, there's only a few times when the scripture mentions numbers, uh, and this is one of them. And one thing let me, let me say to that, I had a, an opportunity in India one time, uh, to, or a couple of times, to preach to crowds of perhaps 20,000 people, something like that, and uh, that's I, I stood there on the, on the stage, or sat on the stage, and I counted, I, in my mind, I kind of cordoned off a group of people, and I counted. And I got up to about 5,000. And then I figured out how many times that was uh, duplicated in the crowd. And uh, I think 20,000 or so was a, a fairly conservative estimate. Um, when we gave the invitation, I estimated about 6,000 people came forward and made a profession of faith. Um, did they all get saved? I doubt it very, very much. Out of 6,000 people, there would almost have to be people that were confused, that didn't understand, that were not sincere, or something. Um, they were adding Christ to their Hinduism or something along those lines. I don't know. Uh, but here, this is the inspired word of God. Okay, they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay, that's God doing the counting. Okay, uh, so we know this is, is true. Um, an incredible thing to happen in Jerusalem just roughly a month and a half after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay, that's, that's a pretty phenomenal thing to happen. Um, and the church was founded on that day, I believe, and uh, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, and so on. And uh, people were saved on a daily basis uh, there in Jerusalem. And it was a marvelous, marvelous thing. So we see the promise in Acts chapter 1. And then we see the fulfillment of it in Acts chapter 2. And then we see that this fulfillment continues in some respects. Um, because the filling of the Spirit is repeated over and over again. It is something that can happen even to the same person multiple times being placed by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ happens to a believer once. Having the Holy Spirit come and indwell that believer's body, that happens once. But a believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit multiple times. Uh, there's not anything in the Bible that says that there's a certain number of times you should be filled, and beyond that, you know, you, you can't be filled again. or any, There's nothing like that, okay? Uh, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit is to grant power to be a witness, power to testify about Christ, and I believe to have an impact, to have an effect upon people. Um, we'll talk about that effect uh, more later, uh, but this is something that in a, a Christian's life is going to be needed over and over and over again. And so we need to be open to this and ready for it. And, okay, we're going to see in, in Acts chapter 2, or Acts chapter 1 and 2, Christ promised that this was going to happen. They were going to receive power when the Holy Spirit came. Acts chapter 2, it happened. I expect that between the ascension of Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the believers spent a great deal of time in prayer. But I don't think the Spirit's coming was in answer to prayer because it was in, in fulfillment of a promise, a promise that Christ had given. Okay, it was going to come, period, because Christ promised it. Um, the next time it happens 
in Acts chapter 4, we see that they prayed for it. And it happened. So let's go to Acts chapter 4. And um, we'll pick up in verse... Well, let's start reading in verse uh, 24. Uh, this is Peter and John have been arrested for preaching. They have been mistreated. They've been commanded to not preach in the name of Christ. And they went back to their own company in verse 23. Uh, and then in 24, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Uh, we'll stop there for the moment. They returned to their own company, Peter and John did. They told them everything that had happened, and the, pre the people lifted their voice with one accord to God and asked for boldness to preach the gospel, boldness to speak the word. Okay, they've been threatened. Their leaders have been threatened and mistreated. And so now they're saying, Lord, we need boldness in order to continue preaching the gospel. Uh, they continue in their prayer in verse 30. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Uh, this, of course, was in the very early days of the church, and we believe that there were spiritual gifts operating in those days that uh, have um, been taken away from the church. They are no longer used, such as the gift of healing. Um, does God answer prayers and heal people? Yes, he does. Uh, I think we've seen that sometimes. Uh, there's other times that we've asked for people to be healed and God has chosen not to, and that's entirely up to him. Uh, but here uh, was a time that they had uh, signs and wonders uh, to perform, and they did this on a pretty regular basis. So uh, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Um, if you look over in chapter 5, verse 14, which would be not very long after uh, chapter 4, it says, uh, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. And so um, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, and on, we see that souls being saved was one of the results of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the fulfillment is continued. Um, we see some similarities between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. The place was shaken. Um, it doesn't mention in Acts chapter 4 the rushing mighty wind or the cloven tongues of fire. Uh, so these things were not necessary uh, to accompany the filling of the Spirit. Other times later we'll see it referenced that people are filled with the Holy Spirit and these things are not mentioned at all. So the physical manifestation uh, was not the big issue, okay? It was not the big deal. Um, I think there may be times that people today claim to have cloven tongues of fire and such as that, but it's always somewhere where there are no witnesses. Um, but anyway, um, they prayed with one accord, okay? These, these things, I think, are very, very important. 
and I've preached this before and emphasized this before, but I think it's important. They prayed with one accord. Okay? This was a united church. And I think unity among Christians is very, very important for our power and our fruitfulness. Um, they were all, in verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, no exceptions. Uh, this was a spiritual church, a very spiritual church. Um, there are very few churches today that I think could genuinely pray with one accord and genuinely all be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think in the average Christian church today, evangelical or even fundamental, uh, you'd have a whole bunch of people that weren't really concerned about witnessing to people. Um, they were of one heart and one soul. Verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. They were so united that they were willing to give up their own property for the sake of everybody else in the church. Okay, now there's nothing that indicates that this is, is something that God commands us to do. We are to love each other as ourselves, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, but there's nothing that says that you have to go out and sell your property and give the proceeds to the church to distribute evenly uh, to everybody. Uh, they did it, and apparently this is the only time they did it because it's not mentioned again. Um, but they're all filled, they have one heart and one soul, and with great power, verse 33, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Um, there's a couple of things here. Great power, okay, upon the apostles to witness, and notice it's of the resurrection. Okay, they undoubtedly talked about the death, the burial, but also the resurrection. And many times today, I think when, when preachers give the gospel, it's fairly common for them to talk about the death of Christ for our sin, and that ought to be mentioned, the blood that was shed for our sin, uh, his death, but also we need to tell people, and he's alive today, and can save your soul. Um, so great power, great grace was upon them all, okay, upon every one. And by this time, the church is thousands of people, okay? It went from a handful to thousands virtually overnight. And now they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They have one heart and one soul, one accord, and great grace. God's grace is upon them all. Uh, that's a pretty phenomenal thing. And because of that, multitudes continued to get saved. Um, okay, let's go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, and we get to the story of Stephen. Uh, but in Acts chapter 6, there, there arose a problem. It says that there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the church was taking care of Christian women who were widows, who did not have family to support them and so on, and the church was watching out for them. And apparently there were some, uh, and these are probably all Jews, maybe a few Gentile who were, Gentiles who were proselytes into Judaism. But when it says Grecians, it doesn't just mean Greeks, it means Greek Jews. Jewish people who had been raised in the Greek portions of the world. Um, and then the Hebrews are those who were local. So they had this dispute. Um, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples in verse 2 unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will continually give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So they needed people to pass out food, okay? Set the tables, clean up afterward, uh, that kind of thing, okay? They needed waiters. 
And so what do they say? They say to the church, Look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They wanted godly, spiritual men. They needed sp spirit-filled men to do what is really kind of menial labor. Okay, but it's for the church. It's for the Lord. It's for God's people. So it needs to be good people. It needs to be godly men. It needs to be spirit-filled men. And so they said, find us seven like that. In verse 5, it says, The saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, uh, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So they chose these seven men, and uh, most people consider this to be the first deacons in the church, not church leaders, but church servants. Um, okay, so Stephen is one of those who is chosen, and uh, he is a godly man, a, a true godly man. Well then, um, verse 8, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So these are, are Jewish people, unbelievers, who are from uh, these various places. Some of, is North Africa, some is Asia Minor, and uh, they're probably all Greeks, uh, Jewish people of Greek heritage. Um, and so it says they were not able, they disputed with Stephen, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Okay, so Stephen is disputing with them, he's, he's telling them I think about Christ and they are fighting this. They are arguing with him and uh, they can't stand up to him. They cannot refute him. They cannot shut him down. They can't make him go away. Okay, He is, is courageous. He's bold. He's speaking with wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, they don't have any answers. And they get furious. And so they hire men uh, to tell lies about Stephen and saying that he is talking about the destruction of the temple and he's blaspheming Moses and God and that kind of thing. Um, so they continue. Stephen begins to, to speak to the, uh, the council. They take, take him before the Sanhedrin. Most of chapter 7 is Stephen's address to the Sanhedrin. And uh, what, is, what is the end of this? What is the result of this? Thousands being saved? Well, perhaps in the long run, but on that day, no. Do most of the Sanhedrin get right with God and believe in Christ? No. Apparently none of them do at that moment. Instead, they stone Stephen to death. Okay? Now, we have seen Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4 and 5, that the people preach with boldness and thousands come to Christ. Thousands come to Christ. They're coming to Christ daily. The, the church is just growing by leaps and bounds and leaps and bounds and leaps and bounds. Then we come to Stephen, who is a godly man, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, full of power, doing great things. He's even performing signs and wonders. He preaches the gospel to the Sanhedrin and they take him out and stone him to death. Okay? The thing is that the power of the Holy Spirit is given not to guarantee great results, but to guarantee there will be some result. Okay? You're going to get through to the people. And many times it will be souls being saved. Lots and lots and lots of times it will be souls being saved and churches growing, but there are going to be times that that's not going to happen and that persecution may be the result. 
Okay, the Apostle Paul obviously was one of the great evangelists of the church, and yet he had his head cut off. Peter was crucified upside down, and so on and so on. Think of, of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about by faith Noah did this, and by faith Abraham did this, and by faith Moses did this, and it says that you know women had their dead raised to life, and so on, and then all of a sudden it says, and others were crucified, or not crucified, but they were were executed, they were sawn asunder with the sword, they, you know, this and that and the other thing happened to them. Okay? They were still men of faith. Um, the fact that some were executed and some had great revivals um, does not mean one's right with God and one isn't. Okay? Uh, God is the one who determines what the fruit is going to be, what the results are going to be. And uh, the thing is that the filling of the Spirit gives us courage and boldness, power to preach and to communicate the message in such a way that people understand it, that people get it. They may reject it, but they get it. Okay, so I think that's very, very important uh, for us to see. Okay, so we talked this morning about walking in the Spirit and how that walking in the Spirit is for the purpose of giving us victory over sin, giving us control of the lusts of our flesh, giving us the fruit of the Spirit, giving us the attributes of Christ, not the attributes of His deity, but His characteristics such as gentleness and love and honesty and integrity, that kind of thing. Um, but walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit, which is as we've talked about tonight, is for the power or the purpose of power in proclaiming the gospel. That's what the filling of the Spirit is for. But they complement each other. Uh, the church in Acts chapter 4, and we've emphasized this over and over, one accord, one heart, one soul, all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all spake with boldness. A great grace was upon them all. The apostles had great power to proclaim the gospel. Uh, this was clearly a very, very godly church. This was clearly a group of Christians that are, are genuinely walking in the Spirit and are very Christ-like in their manner of life. These are godly Christians. Um, so we see that These are the people that power comes upon. Uh, these are the kind of people that God can bless with that kind of power. Okay? Um, tell you what, I, something just occurred to me. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, um, we'll start in verse 20. Uh, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, and I think that goes back to verse 19 where it says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, and further back as well, where it's talking about verse 16, for instance, shun profane and vain babblings. They will increase unto more ungodliness. So if we will cleanse ourselves, if a man therefore purge himself from these, these evil things, these wicked things, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Okay, so if we live a godly life, if we live a, live a clean and holy life, then we will be a vessel that God can use. Okay? Uh, these people in Acts chapter 4, for instance, were vessels that God could use. 
He could send the filling of the Holy Spirit upon them. He could send them great power and great grace. He could give them boldness to speak, and they would take that and use it for God's glory. Um, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to cover this real quickly. We covered this somewhat this morning. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and uh, okay, let's, let's start reading with verse 1, and, and we won't comment on much of this. Do you begin again, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Forasmuch as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Uh, he's talking about his ministry there in Corinth. And that the church that he left behind was a testimony to what he had done, what he had accomplished, and to the power uh, which had accomplished this. Not, uh, not written in ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, for instance. Okay? Um, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. He's saying we didn't do it. Our sufficiency is of God. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. He goes on continuing to talk about the ministration of death and the ministration of life and so on. Uh, and so he's talking about the Holy Spirit's work in him through him in his ministry. Okay? Then we get down to verse 17, uh, which we talked about this morning. Now the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So here he turns from the the work of, of the Holy Spirit in the ministry, which is what he has talked about in most of the chapter, but now he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives, and how he changes us to be like Christ, in the image of Christ. He continues in this in chapter 4, and remember the chapter divisions are man-made. This is continuing the same idea. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, because God has given us mercy. We don't quit. We don't give in. We don't give up. Uh, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So he's still talking about well, he's kind of combining the idea of our ministry, and, but then also our own personal life. And he says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We do not walk in craftiness. We don't handle the Word of God deceitfully. Paul says, we're sincere, we're genuine, we're for real. We're not, this isn't make-believe to us. We really earnestly are, are working for Christ. Um, and he says, but, but by manifestation of the truth. If we live the truth, then we manifest it to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This godly living is very, very important to the communication of the gospel. A person who knows Christ, knows the gospel, but is not living for Christ, doesn't have the power of God upon him to communicate the message. And the message is not going to get through, at least not like I mean, everybody can win a person to Christ every once in a while if they try hard enough. Uh, but they don't have the filling of the Spirit upon them. Uh, they're not a clean vessel that God can use. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And I think that sin in a Christian's life, even if it is, he says, hidden things of dishonesty, even if people don't know it, 
sin in a Christian life, a Christian's life hides the gospel from those who need it. Um, in whom the God of this world, but it seems that a Christian could actually be cooperating in the devil's work because the devil is blinding the minds of them which believe not. And a Christian can be hiding the gospel from the people that the devil is blinding. And that's a terrible thing. Um, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. We have this, this wonderful message inside us that God has given us to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to take this message and let it shine to the world. But we have this treasure, okay, this incredible treasure, the truth of the gospel, the only way anybody can ever get to heaven. We have this wonderful message, this treasure in earthen vessels. Okay, we're just clay pots. That's all we are. We're earthen vessels, okay? But we have a treasure within us. And then he says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, okay? It's not us. It's not our eloquence. It's not our intelligence. It's not our way with words. It's not our winning personality. It's God, okay? The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. And it's, it's God who has the power to communicate that message, which He is willing to bestow upon us in order to give us results of one sort or another. Uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't guarantee a big church. Um, <laughs> there are people with big churches that I think are not filled with the Holy Spirit. I think there's tons of them. Um, but God's power is available. Uh, we have the power of God to help us to walk in the Spirit, to be godly people, and being godly people, we can seek, I think as they did in Acts chapter 4, they prayed, they asked God, give us boldness, and I think that that should be uh, our prayer on a regular basis, is that God would give us boldness to speak His Word. There is so much uncertainty in life. So many things, we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. We don't know how our life is going to end up. But there is one thing that we can know. There is one thing that we can be certain about, and that is where are we going to spend eternity? I'm Matt Floyd, I'm the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in South Florida, and I wanna share with you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. There's two options. When you die, you'll either go to heaven, spend an eternity with God in heaven, or you'll spend eternity in hell. No one wants to go there, and I don't want you to go there either. See, we have a God who loves us so much that he doesn't want us to go to hell either. He would like all of us to spend eternity in heaven with him. So many people say that you can't know for sure that you're going to heaven, but the Bible says in 1 John 5.13 that you can know that you have eternal life. And if God says it, I believe it. So how can we know for sure we're going to heaven? Well, most people think, well, I have to be good, I have to get baptized, I have to go to church, I have to, and they have a whole list of things that they have to do. They have to do more good than bad. But the Bible says that we're all sinners, and sin cannot go to heaven. God can't let sin into heaven, or we'd have death in heaven. I'm going to let this hand represent you and me, and I'm going to let my phone represent our sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This hand represents God. Our sin separates us from Him. God can't let that sin into heaven. That sin must be paid for. And all the good works in the world isn't going to pay for that sin. Because, you see, the Bible says the wages of sin, that payment of sin, is death. If you die with that sin on you, you'll spend an eternity in hell forever. But God doesn't want us to go to hell. So what's the answer? Well, letting this hand represent Jesus, 
Jesus was the answer. You see, he never sinned. He came to this earth 2,000 years ago. He was 100% God and 100% man. He never sinned. He didn't have any sin to pay for. And he came for the purpose of dying in your place and in my place. He hung on the cruel cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. He took our sins upon him, was buried, and the third day rose again, paying for that sin. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So how can I know that I'm going to heaven? By believing that Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross. He died, was buried, and the third day rose again, paying for my sin. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't pay for your own sin. You can't work your way to heaven. So right now, put your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, that he died in your place to pay for your sin. And if you did that, by the promise of the word of God, you can know that you have eternal life. What a glorious thing we can have. So you not, might not be sure about what's going to happen tomorrow, but you can be sure of where you will spend eternity. Trust Jesus and trust him today. Thank you.